Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on Introduction to Fiction, Part 5, People Playing Symbols. In this video, we're going to just take a look at the ways in which people themselves are symbolic, or attributes about people are symbolic, within the nature of literature. And again, as I've said before in this, in this lecture series on, on fiction, uh, anything that we cover in here around symbolism, representation, interpretation, it doesn't just apply to fiction or literary fiction, it applies to all forms of storytelling. So anything you see here, I encourage you to try it out, to experiment with it in other forms of storytelling, whether you're watching TV or you're watching a movie or reading a comic book. Really try to play around with these and see what new meanings you can come up with. All right, so away we, all right, so we have Christ figures. And Christ figures are characters that somehow invoke, represent, or play in some way in relation to Jesus Christ, who is the major figure of Christianity. So in this, you don't necessarily have to know the Bible extensively. You don't have to believe in the Bible at all. Uh, this is more about, because of the role of Christianity in Western tradition, because of how many people have read the Bible in Western culture, and just how important of a, of a text it is, inevitably many, many writers will invoke Christ-like characters. Uh, and this is not, and this doesn't mean that it's Christian fiction by any means. There are Christ-like characters in, well, the Lord of the Rings, in Star Wars, in, uh, in Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter himself could be considered a Christ-like figure. Um, you know, he dies, he comes back, those kind of things. So just kind of be aware that we're talking about Christ as a character, or we're talking about him being used as a fiction, as a fiction, as a divisive fiction. And so don't be too concerned that, you know, or, or don't feel like this is preaching, this is more understanding the role and significance of Christianity has also influenced the way in which fiction gets written um, and experienced. So let's take a look at that. So first we have to recognize that Christ-like figures in fiction may not always be male. They can be male, they can be female, they can be trans, they can be um, intersex, they can be a lot of different types. Don't expect your Christ figure to be easily just a, a exact spinning image of Christ. However, there are things that can, that can identify a person as a Christ figure. So that can include literally or symbolically being crucified, right? And so literally the person is actually crucified or symbolically crucified. That is, you know, they were, they're put up on, you know, they put up on display um, for public humiliation. A good example of that that I, I often like is uh, if you ever watch the TV show Smallville, uh, in the first episode of the series, the, su the Clark Kent as a teenage boy in high school is essentially crucified. Now the image that you're seeing right now in the upper left corner, that's, that's Clark Kent in season one, and the on the, the, the larger image is Lois Lane in, I think, season 9 or 10, one of the later seasons where they come back to, you know, she, she's put up in the field just like Clark was. Um, but in both cases, you know, symbolically, they're being crucified. Now, for Clark Kent, it makes sense. There, you know, there's a lot of arguments and representations of of Superman as a character, as a Christ figure, right? He's sent to Earth, um, you know, he, he's, he's Krypton's only son, uh, or surviving son, he's sent to Earth, he has these powers, uh, these supreme powers. He can walk on, you know, he can walk on water, he can, he can do many magical feats, um, so, you know, so he is part of them and not part of them and all of that. And so we do see kind of that idea of a symbolic crucifixion. Uh, often Christ characters will suffer for others, um, that is, take their, take their suffering into himself or herself, uh, is kind to outcasts, that is, is willing to help the poor, is willing to help those people that the rest of society would disregard. 
regard. Uh, is either young, as in like up to the age of 12, or potentially around the age of 33, because again, that's very similar to uh, to what we see of Christ. Does manual labor, particularly around woodwork, you know, if your character is, is a carpenter, that may be a, a strong indication that the character is a Christ figure, since Christ himself was a carpenter, and he, you know, his um, his adoptive father, father Joseph was a carpenter. Solitary journeys. So you know there, there's there's several times in which or there, Christ does take these solitary journeys. He goes out into the desert. He goes kind of to face down the devil. So you're looking for you know times in which the character goes off on on his or her own to prove themselves or to battle with inner demons or external demons. And that he has fo he or she has followers, typically twelve, because again you're thinking about the apostles, um, but that people are following this person and believing this person as a higher or important being. Uh, wise but gentle, so has a soft touch, is often insightful, often tells stories to prove points. Um, and of course, if they're resurrected, although zombies don't count. Zombies aren't resurrected, um, even though they come back from the dead, resurrected as in dies, whether realistically or symbolically. So again, you know, Harry Potter is a good example. He, I would say he symbolically dies and is resurrected, doesn't actually die. Uh, but when you see characters being resurrected, that's a potential sign. Um, loves the world despite the negative aspects, right? So Superman is a good example. You know, his love for Earth has him continually trying to save it, and he's not like, say, a Batman character who <laughs> sees, you know, the, the evil in the world. But Batman, uh, Superman, really does seem to love the world and wants wants to be a part of it. Has you know performs magical feats, uh, walk you know, and those can include typically walking you know turning wine into water, I'm sorry, <laughs> turning water into wine, um, walking on water, or healing the sick, um, but not just those you know those are the the most significant, but you know can uh, any kind of magical feat uh, that the the character has if you can you know often if you can tie together one or you know probably three or four of these traits around the character there's a good chance that the character is a Christ figure so let's also look at physical signs um, and this is to understand that the physical body is is part of the character and that things done to the body also represent the character and you know some some classic examples of that Darth Vader, right? So Darth Vader is originally a is a originally Anakin Skywalker, but Anakin Skywalker becomes so corrupted with the dark side of the Force that it eventually becomes more machine than human. And it's only when Darth Vader, you know, he literally becomes more machine. Um, he's barely human, and it's only when Darth Vader begins to return to the light side of the force that we start we see we get to see his face right he takes off the mask he we start to see him human again so there's a place where the body is also representative of the character the tin man right so here is a character who is completely devoid of actual physical attributes and you know that that's supposed to tell us about his inner being he does you know he he's tin he has this tough exterior um, and, and some of it is to protect that non-existent heart that he has. Frankenstein, or in the, I, I say Frankenstein, but really should be saying Frankenstein's monster. The monster was never called, was not named Frankenstein. The doctor who created him was. But Frankenstein's monster, which was the picture we saw at the beginning of this presentation, uh, is another great example of, you know, he's a patchwork of body parts. And he, he's piecemealed together. He does he isn't he isn't born naturally. And so his physical his physical creation also creates a also represents his inner mind and in that his mind isn't necessarily properly formed. Right? He's born into the world as an adult. He is patched together by these different pieces without the natural process of becoming an adult. And so that plays out um, as his character. So it's important to know that marks on a body mean something. Again, this is all within fiction. They're, that they represent something else that's going on, 
right? So if you've ever read Harry Potter, which I've already referenced a few times, you know, his light, his little lightning bolt above his eye, eyebrow means something. It means he's been struck by lightning. And if we think about that in symbolic values, lightning is a very powerful symbol. Um, it is very, you know, we see it or we understand it as being potentially destructive, but we also think about lightning as, as powerful. And so Harry Potter is struck with this, you know, literally struck with this lightning bolt on his forehead that says he can be destructive and powerful. So how do we, how does Harry or how does the world in which Harry inhabits um, deal with that? If you've ever seen The Lion King, Scar, right? Character has literally a scar. Um, and, you know, it marks him as being, you know, the, the scar. In historically, ugliness or particularly, uh, you know, scarring or any kind of mark on the body did indicate something negative. So if a character was phys physically non-attractive by cultural standards or was marred in some way, right, it was it was to indicate there was something wrong with that person. So the character Scar from The Lion King, you know, that scar is representative, of course, of him being sullied, of him being, um, of there being something wrong with him. And then there's Mina. If you've ever read Dracula, the f when Mina is taken by Dracula, she all of a sudden gets a mark on her, and that mark indicates her impurity, right? Because Dracula has drank her blood, she, you know, and he has, she has drank some of his, that there's something impure about her, and that mark doesn't go away until Dracula is slain. Injuries are also important. So again, I've mentioned Luke Skywalker. Him losing his hand is a loss of virility, is a loss of power, especially, you know, in, in some ways, some would argue it's an act of castration. It is very interesting at the end of movie two that he is castrated as we get into movie th as we get into Return of the Jedi. Of course, his roman his original romantic interest with Leia, which we find out it is a, is his sister, is no longer there. In some ways, he's been castrated. While Han Solo and, and Leia obviously kind of obviously fall in love and all that. Spider-Man. He's bitten by a radioactive spider, and, you know, that injury then manifests into some kind of, you know, into his powers. And so it, that injury has an impact on who he becomes. It you know, being bit by a spider inspires him to be that spider and, and kind of act like a spider. And injuries can reflect the person or the world. So this is something to remember that what happens to that character isn't just representative of that character, but it can also reflect the world. Uh, I talk about Walter White in this regard from the series Breaking Bad. Walter White you know, or, or ends up with cancer, and that's a very interesting injury for a character to deal with, and it can be a reflection of the world, and in, in the world in which Walter White is living, which can be seen as a cancerous world. There are all sorts of things that are wearing on him, you know, in, in particular finances, you know, his ability to support his family and the like. Um, Jekyll and Hyde, the, the, the character Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, the, the actual injuries of this split personality in which one, one portion of or one identity wants to be good and the other identity wants to partake of bad also speak about the ways in which the world of the late 1800s was challenging for people to be both respectable but also want to you know enjoy themselves in ways in which culture wouldn't allow them so other character traits you want to keep an eye out for blindness um, because when we deal with, with with blindness we are they may lack sight um, but they may be also, you know, but we're dealing with different types of lack of sight. Um, but it might also mean that they're insightful in other ways. You know, a tradition, a, a famous trope within fiction and in storytelling is, of course, the person that's blind is often some kind of soothsayer or oracle or has some kind of larger insight. 
But when we deal with blindness, even, you know, we, we see some characters are sometimes struck temporarily blind, or their view is impacted, um, you know, they have an eye that gets, you know, that's get cut out, uh, or, you know, that, that they lose an eye. These are all implications of lacking some other kind of sight. But if the character is blind from the beginning, that may enlighten us to the character being insightful in other ways. Heart disease, um, it, it's a wonderful symbolic uh, trait. It, it's something that is, is really nice because, of course, you could talk about heart disease as being a corrupt heart. And then we're not talking about the physical heart, but the emotional heart. Um, it could be a corrupt society. This is something I want you to think about when you read Young Goodman Brown, is that, you know, the ways in which, you know, we Young Goodman Brown doesn't die of heart disease, but, you know, that corrupt society and the ways in which that can corrupt a person's heart, right? That environment that the person is surrounded by, does that corrupt or, or I mean, kill them in a, in a literal way? Illness, um, not all illnesses are equal, right? So some illnesses are very pretty illnesses where the character slowly fades away, and so, you know, where other illnesses are... are vile and, and, and disgusting and, and you want to be asking why is the author, just like we looked at with violence and other things, why is the author choosing this type of illness for their character? What purpose is it serving? How does this enhance the experience of the story or enhance what we know and understand about this character? Right? Illness is congruent to the character or the situation. Right, so how does this illness relate to all the things that are going on? Because right, again, nobody gets ill in fiction accidentally. It's all mastermind by the author. Fever is nice because, you know, it can indicate different things. The character's too hot. Um, and what could that mean? Or, you know, it's also a nice way of, of, of talking about other things within the story. Plague is always great because plague talks about uh, you know, a certain degree of what's wrong with the world. You know, look at zombie apocalypse stories. You know, we're dealing with plague and we're dealing with kind of the corrupt society uh, when we look at something that, that strikes everybody. But there's also interest in who the plague does strike and doesn't strike and what does that tell us about the characters. Paralysis, the inability to move or to react. What happens when a character shuts down? How is that representative of where the character is or the people that care for the character? You know, is the paralysis because the character doesn't get the care from the people he or she needs? Tuberculosis was a really popular wasting disease um, for much of literature uh, in the 17 and 18 and even some of the 1900s. It's a, it's a nice one, you know, it's referred to as the wasting disease. It, it works out well for, for plot devices to kind of have this character slowly fading away. Malaria, which translated means bad air. It, you know, and when you think about that idea of bad air, um, is it the air, the air the character is breathing? So does that speak to environment? Does that speak to who's breathing around that character? There's a lot of fun ways you can play with illnesses to mean different things. And then venereal disease and AIDS, right? These are ones that are sexually transmitted uh, Infections, these are the ones in which, you know, you're dealing with sex, you're dealing with purity, right? They, we, we have a very, we, we aren't very good with sex, as I mentioned in the lecture, in one of the previous lectures, we have a history of censorship around it, we don't, we don't really talk about it well, um, and so of course when characters end up with venereal disease uh, or, you know, sexually transmitted infections, there's a lot, um, there's obviously a lot more going on there. There's judgment being passed or implicated, um, th there's a lot of complex things around that. All right, so that's all for this mini-lecture. Thank you very much for listening, and I will see you in the next lecture.